Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the rain this morning. I know I did. Uh, uh, I was teaching classes this morning, and uh, my students all came in soaking wet, so it was kind of funny to watch them. Uh, I'm Elaine Kramer. I'm the president of the board here at the LBJ Museum. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's fall lecture. Uh, I do want to take a moment to uh, recognize a few of our board members that are here. Uh, Judge Linda Rodriguez. And most of them made some of the refreshments that we had for the reception. Uh, they are recipes out of Gene Schuler's cookbook, uh, At Home with Ladybird. So we're eating some of Ladybird's recipes. Um, I also want to thank Debbie Butler, our museum manager. She's going to arrange the show, of course. Uh, and also Lisa Adams, who's our uh, assistant manager. Um, she couldn't be here tonight, but she's the one who does all the Facebook posts and everything else. Uh, in addition, if you like the sound system, uh, we have Melissa Millican to thank for that. Uh, thank you very, very much for that. Um, as a history major in college, I would sort of persistently get questions about, well, what the heck are you going to do with your history degree? And so it wasn't until after I read Eudora Welty's The Robber Bridegroom that it occurred to me that my, my life was going to be fulfilled if I was going to be a park ranger on the Natchez Trace Parkway in Mississippi, <laughs> tell stories up and down the parkway, and live in either Natchez or Vicksburg. Well, that idea only lived as a dream in my mind. Our speaker tonight lived that dream in reality. Uh, David Bella grew up in Wharton, Texas, and as he says, he is the son, grandson of a sharecropper. He graduated from Texas A&M with a degree in recreational parks and tourism, tourism science, in 1982. Upon graduation, David embarked on an exceptional 38-year career in public service that culminated as acting director of the U.S. National Park Service, the first Latino to hold that position. Now, along the way, he held some positions that make me very jealous, including superintendent of Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming, no, I'm the superintendent at the George Washington Memorial Parkway. It's not the Natchez Straits Parkway, but it's pretty cool. But, um, and the positions with the San Antonio Missions National Historical Park, Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia, and Independence National Historical Park in Philadelphia. Dave is also the author of Ola Rancha, My Journey Through the National Parks, which chronicles his time in the Park Service and the impact that the parks had on his life. And we have copies available for purchase after the, the, the lecture this evening. But of course, it's for his association with the Johnson family and his time as superintendent of the LBJ National Historical Park as to why he's here tonight. As superintendent, David was responsible for the overall management and operation of the park and worked closely with the Johnsons in that capacity. From holiday tree lighting, lighting events to functions in the Texas White House, he worked closely with Mrs. Johnson and her staff to ensure a safe and memorable experience on the LBJ Ranch. So we're pleased and honored to have someone who can give us a personal look at the workings of the ranch and share wonderful experiences and intimate memories of Lady Bird. Ladies and gentlemen, to present the fall lecture, A Portrait of Lady Bird, Memories of a Friend, please welcome David Bell. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? It's a new mic, so we're trying it out. Awesome, it worked. Uh, I'm mic'd up on a number of places, so hopefully they'll stay in place. Uh, but it is a truly an honor and a, and a pleasure for me to, to be with you tonight. I, I just came back from uh, Florida where I uh, gave keynote remarks uh, at the Association of National Park Rangers before my colleagues from around the country. And uh, I know when I first got the email, uh, uh, I was held at Lady Bird. And I remember looking at my calendar, I'm like, okay, yeah, we can move this. Yeah, we can cancel this. Uh, 
but there was no way we were going to miss this. So I want to thank you, my dear friend, fellow Aggie, uh, former professor at, at Texas A&M, for the opportunity to be with you here tonight. It is something special for me to reflect upon uh, my journey through the national parks with Lady Bird Johnson. But before we get there, it may be helpful for me to kind of share with you where that, that journey began and why it began. So as mentioned, um, I grew up in Wharton, Texas. My wife of 43 years and I, she was my kindergarten classmate, my high school sweetheart, and she's very much part of my journey through the national parks. Melissa was one of those students that in kindergarten, she would sit in the front of the class. I would sit in the back of the class guarding the graham crackers. I was ready for that bell to start ringing and start eating. <laughs> but the National Honor Society, DAR, and all that girl state, that was Melissa. That was not me. I was more into the football and, and, and that type of the, the educational experience. Um, and so Melissa sends her, 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 her best regards. Growing up in Wharton, Texas was quite an experience back in the 60s. Uh, if you're familiar with Wharton, uh, Wharton's claim to fame are its agricultural products, uh, cotton, corn, rice, pecans, and Wharton County Junior College, which I had the honor of, of attending, uh, where I received a, a, an Associate of Arts degree in theater. Now, why is that important? So my greatest role models, I'm the oldest of uh, three kids, I'm the oldest of 12 grandkids. As was mentioned, my grandfather was a sharecropper. His influence on my grandparents on me, including my parents, was immeasurable. And Debbie, I want you to help me because I could. This old park ranger can talk and talk, but I want to make time for Q and A. Okay, so Debbie, can you help me keep track of time? Or, yeah, good. Okay, good. Um, my role models were literally in the bedroom, right around the corner from, from us. My daddy of. 500 plus years of Vela family history was the first to get a college degree. I tra traced my ancestors back to 1465 from Spain. Uh, amazing history there. I give speeches around the country especially related to my book and I, and I talk to especially college kids and I talk about, have you ever Googled your last name? Have you ever Googled your last name? It may surprise you. <laughs> It may shock you, and especially if you do a DNA test, it will blow your mind as to what might be part of who you are. Vela, in Spanish, means the guardian, the watchman. And how interesting, because in the 60s, during the Cold War, the United States developed the Vela satellites to spy on the Russians to make sure that they were following the test ban treaties. Interesting. And how interesting, too, that two Velas, myself and our son, were responsible for helping to protect our nation's most special places, our national parks. Two of my ancestors were captain in the Spanish Armada against the British. So what's in a, light? What's in a name? Google it. Find out. It will blow your mind. And I see myself, that DNA, as to one of the reasons why I did what I did over nearly 40 years as a public servant at the state and federal level. Now our son is following in my footsteps as the deputy chief ranger in the Everglades. Uh, our daughter, all of us are graduates of Texas A&M. Our daughter, oop, our daughter is uh, in the education field. We have eight grandkids. One of them will be going to Texas A&M, I can assure you. And maybe a third generation United States National Park Ranger, hopefully. So our upgrading, the foundations that, that served me well in public service at the highest levels of the federal government were because of my parents. One of the most Amazing things that served me well was growing up in a segregated community uh, was my dad telling me as he worked at a sulfur company, the graveyard shift, went to the University of Houston during the daytime to get his bachelor's degree, later got his master's degree at the School of Social Work where he attended University of Michigan with Susseth Travis's son-in-law. 
I'll never forget uh, when dad told us we're going to move to Michigan uh, so he can get his master's degree. Uh, that I would hear Cesar Chavez speak at a rally as a teenager. You talk about life changing. Here you had a man that stood this tall, but his voice was as high as a ceiling. It was phenomenal. The lessons that my parents were able to share with us. Parents also shared with us too something that served me well as I held political office <laughs> and worked for elected officials was, David, if you can't respect the office holder, respect the office that they hold. Now, I want you to keep that in mind because we're going to get into specifics about what that means, okay? So Warden was a place, it was a tough place. We learned about segregation. We learned a little bit about uh, discrimination. Um, but it was a great place to, to learn about life. Um, and the experiences that we had to include a trip that my parents decided to take uh, which literally changed my life. One day around the dinner table, my parents said, we're gonna go to Yellowstone National Park. And we're like, we're teenagers, we're like, we're, what? Yellow, what, what's Yellowstone? And then we found out how long it was gonna take, and we're like, oh no, we ain't traveling three days to get to Yellowstone. Uh, we're not a family of financial means at all, but we are rich in faith and family and exploration. So we get in the car, all five of us, we head towards Yellowstone. The first stop was Grand Teton National Park. Have you been to Grand Teton? I was just there 72 hours ago. Then went to Jacksonville to give a speech. Uh, that iconic mountain range was phenomenal. Because we weren't a family of financial means, just to make ends meet, mom would buy, go to the grocery store along the route and would buy a bag of Fritos and a loaf of bread and we would have Frito sandwiches so that we didn't have to stop at a restaurant. And that was back in the 70s. How expensive would a restaurant been back in the well, late 60s, early 70s back then? But for this Latino family, it must have been pretty expensive. <laughs> Frito sandwiches was the meal of the day. To this day, my mother cannot open a bag of Fritos without getting sick. <laughs> I don't care, I'll open it. We'll put it in a bowl for bread, we're good to go. But the first stop was Grand Teton National Park. That iconic mountain range, elk, bison, mule deer, antelope, black bear, and when we found out that there were grizzly bear, we're like, oh, hell no, we're going back to Warden. Uh-uh, we ain't dealing with grizzly bears. But also, too, when we didn't see people that looked like us. We didn't see rangers that looked like us. We didn't see visitors that looked like us. It could have been an intimidating place back in the 60s, early 70s. But it wasn't. And then seeing the iconic image of that National Park Ranger, that green and, 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 and uh, gray uniform, the Stetson, the Smokey the Bear hat, the gold badge, seeing that for the first time as a teenager, and especially in Yellowstone at Old Faithful, where this ranger was going on backcountry patrol with two horses, with a Winchester rifle, a pistol, on backcountry patrol, changed my life. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what they did. I didn't care. You get paid to work out here in these places? Are you kidding me? And wear that, that uniform? Life changing. That experience enabled me to get to meet her. Came back, realized that uh, rangers have to speak in public. Again, I only cared about two things, Melissa and playing football in high school. Uh, Melissa was all state and band. I was all state and choir. The theater teacher from high school said, hey Dave, I need you to come out to a play. I want you to be in Little Abner, the musical Little Abner. You want me to do what? <laughs> play? Acting? In the 70s? Ain't happening. It did. <laughs> I got a theater scholarship in college. Wow. And I'm able to stand before you today, all these years later, because of the confidence that that the high school theater director gave to me. She's in my book. So life has given me a, a lot of opportunities to do things I never knew what would be possible, let alone graduate from Texas A&M with, with my kindergarten classmate. 
The first job that we had were in the missions in San Antonio. We were the first rangers to open the missions in the early 1980s. 95% of the staff of rangers were Latino. The missions are active parishes. The descendants of the indigenous people still live in those neighborhoods. In San Jose, San Juan, Concepcion, Espada. The superintendent Jose Cisneros realized that we got one shot to get it right as government employees with those communities. And we did. He did. And I give Jose a lot of credit. Uh, that's, that's where that journey began. But you got to remember our uniforms look very much like Border Patrol. So we'd go into restaurants and with the uniform and the Smokey the Bear hat and we're like, where's everybody go? <laughs> you know? What's happened? We didn't say anything. Where's everybody going? We realized that we got a lot more work to do. We figured it out. And uh, it was one of the most amazing experiences. But while I was there, uh, as a 21-year-old site supervisor at Mission San Juan, my supervisor said, Dave, you're going to need to learn how to do museum curation. And the best place to get that is at Linda B. Johnson National Historical Park by renowned curator Libby Hewlett. Now Libby's husband, Barney, you remember, flew Marine One for, for John F. Kennedy and LBJ on the White House South Lawn in the helicopter. Libby was renowned curator. So Libby teaches me, 21 years old, first time ever at the park, first time ever at the Texas White House, first time ever on the ranch. My job was to catalog suits that the president wore in the White House. <laughs> Hit a Quonset hut, federal property. It was like walking into a mini Smithsonian Institute. <laughs> Stuff that would never see the light of day to the public. But I was in this, it was like a kid in a candy store. You know, seeing treasures that no one would ever see. My job was to catalog the suits the president wore in the White House. Put little bitty numbers in his pants. And, I, and then it dawned on me, I'm the only one in the room, I'm holding up LBJ's pants, I'm like, I'm holding the seat of power right here in my hands, man. <laughs> and uh, it was quite the experience. Uh, and I, I just learned so much, just being in the sights and the smells. And, and then one day Libby, after a couple weeks, said, hey, Dave, uh, you want to go to the house? I'm like, that house? The Texas White House? And he said, yeah, come on. Let me call Secret Service. So he called Secret Service, no problem. 21 years old, I'm 63 now, my first experience wouldn't be the last in the Texas White House. Oh my goodness, what an experience. Libby wrote a note to uh, my supervisor dated December 7th, 1981. David proved to be a quick learner and had a great interest in all aspects of curatorial training and work. I feel he should be commended for his interests. Besides his good learning ability, he has a marvelous disposition and personality. He'll be an asset to any park lucky enough to get him. Little did I know then that 23 years later, I'd be the superintendent of Linda B. Johnson National Historical Park. Not bad. And having a chance to meet her and to get to know her. So, let me tell you about the first time we met. I was just appointed, and uh, I was superintendent at Palo Alto Battlefield in Brownsville. I was the third superintendent. The only U.S.-Mexican War property in the National Park System. It was the first battle of the U.S.-Mexican War. I was only the third superintendent. It was 1998. I was asked by a regional office uh, to be the state coordinator for Texas of all the national parks in Texas, which I agreed to do, in addition to being superintendent at LBJ. So the first meeting is held in Lucy Johnson's office. The night before, I got zero sleep. Man, I was praying. I said, I got one shot to get this right. First impressions, right? I'm going to meet Lady Bird Johnson. I couldn't wait, uh, but at the same time, I can't tell you how many novenas I was saying on the way from Round Rock, Texas to Lucy's office in Austin. We go in, we're waiting, Lucy's conference table, Secret Service detail comes in, and there comes Mrs. Johnson. She's sitting right next to me, and I'm like, it's her. <laughs> it's 
really her? And uh, it's like lights kicked in, I'm on the stage, it's time to get down to business. And I remember, you know, so Dave, tell me about yourself. And I said, well, ma'am, um, I'm a product of the Great Society program. She had that same look. So, yes, ma'am, I'm a graduate of Head Start. I am a product of affirmative action. I am the first Latino superintendent to have the honor of preserving yours and the president's legacy for future generations. While my dad was getting his master's degree at the University of Michigan, we were on the food stamp program. That saved us. I can give you a hundred different recipes on how to use government cheese, if you want it. Good stuff. That's what we survived on. But that program provided the basic necessities of life. It still does. And I said, Mrs. Johnson, I'm one of the living legacies of the Great Society program. And it would be the honor of my life to have a chance to get to know you and work with you. That was it. <laughs> I got to tell you folks, I mean, I, I could tell you Lady Bird Johnson stories. Uh, but what's interesting is that Lady Bird's influence carried me throughout my career in the Park Service. So we'll give you specifics about, about the park. Uh, our office was in um, Johnson City. Of course, we had the two units. We had the Johnson City unit, his boyhood home, and then the ranch. Many of you went to the holiday events. Remember the holiday events where Lady Bird would you know, light the trees, and then you have the shuttle buses that would take you through the ranch, and I don't know if any of you remember that. Those were amazing times for us and my family and our two kids to have a chance just to be with Lady Bird and to celebrate the holidays, you know, with her at events there in the Texas White House and, uh, uh, and with the family, especially with Lucy and, and, and Ian, uh, very dear friends, friends of ours. Um, and so, the, there were a, a number of events that, uh, you know, I clearly will never forget. One is, we had an event um, in the Texas White House. I can't remember exactly what it was, but we were fortunate to have our son, who was going to Texas A&M at the time. He played football at A&M. Um, um, and uh, he was sitting, we're in the president's office and, and he's sitting at a table next to Lady Bird. And when you're in the president's office, you can see outside the window. And if you remember, the trams would come in. And because she had secret service protection, you could not step off the trams. Under no circumstances were you gonna step off those trams. And so many times we'd take our kids uh, and we'd be on those trams and we'd look out of the tram looking in the Texas White House and we'd, I wonder if she's there. You know, because we, would we wouldn't have a clue if she was there or not. But on this occasion, Anthony Vela was sitting in the office looking outside the window at the tram, sitting next to Lady Bird Johnson. <laughs> and I'll never forget, he, he, he came up and he said, Dad, the tram, look at the tram. And I said, son, I'll never forget this. I said, don't ever forget this experience and who you're sitting next to. Because so many times, we were in the tram looking into the house, now we're in the house looking outside. Latinos from Morton, Texas, go figure. It was an amazing experience. So between the holiday events and, and, and events like that, it was, it was special. And we kept pinching ourselves, did that really just happen? Did we just, were we chilling out with Lady Bird in the Texas White House? Yeah, we were. It was phenomenal. But on the serious side, every superintendent had to keep and maintain what was called the tribute book. Anybody guess what a tribute book would, would be and why a superintendent would be responsible for maintaining a tribute book? Donations. Sir? Donations? It's a good guess. Yeah, donations. Yeah, they're fair enough. In this case, it was what would happen, no, what will happen when the special agent in charge of her Secret Service detail calls you and says, Superintendent, I'm sorry to inform you that we've lost Mrs. Johnson. By the time I got responsibility for the tribute book, it was this thick. <laughs> Protocols. 
when you got the call. Contact the regional director, contact the director, contact the White House Military Protocol Office, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Help the, with uh, clearly preparations for the cemetery, although the cemetery was private, clearly on federal land. A whole myriad of check boxes that we had to maintain and keep current. There was also something too that was unique for that superintendent is that the superintendent would be responsible uh, representing the National Park Service that when she laid in state at the presidential library uh, that we would be here be there with her for 30 minutes. So just hold that thought. Okay. So the tribute book was quite detailed and again by the time I got a hold of it it was quite thick. So one of the things too that we had, I had two private dinners, Melissa and I, uh, at the Texas White House with Lady Bird. Uh, and always it would be Lucy and Linda, uh, excuse me, Lucy and Ian, and maybe every once in a while some grandkids. But the, the last dinner that we had would be my last with her because I had accepted a promotion to be superintendent of the George Washington Memorial Parkway right outside our nation's capital. So if you've been to DC, everything on the Virginia side from Mount Vernon all the way to the Great Falls of the Potomac uh, were part of the George Washington Memorial Parkway, including Lady Bird Johnson Park and LBJ Grove that were part of that. In this particular case, uh, it would be the last time. Now there was a protocol when you had dinner with Lady Bird. And it would normally be around sunset. She loved a hill country sunset. Loved it. And what she would do, there'd be uh, rocking chairs right outside the president's office. And she loved to sit there and watch the deer scamper by and have the sunset over the Perdinalis. Well, there was a set time when you got to the guard gate because she still had Secret Service protection. Remember that white guard gate? There was that fence before you went into where the ranch was. I mean, where the Texas White House was. So you get there, press the button, Superintendent Vela here for dinner, gates would open. We'd park, and there's ladybirds sitting outside on the rocking chairs. Staff would come out, we'd be greeted, Mr. Johnson, hug, how you doing, ma'am, it's good to see you. Uh, we'd be chilling out uh, there in front uh, for about 15, 20 minutes. And then the staff would come in. I said, Mr. Johnson, it's time to go into the living room. And so you walk in, you've been in the living room of the Texas White House, you know, this big stone fireplace, and you have that huge green ottoman with the seal of the President of the United States in it. That was LBJ's. And I remember we walking in uh, and Mr. Johnson saying, David, you sit right over there. I'm like, no ma'am. I ain't sitting in that chair. That's, that's LBJ's, that's the President's chair. No, no, please, you're the guest of honor. Please sit there. Okay. <laughs> I'm feeling it, man. I'm in LBJ's chair. <laughs> I get the vibes. I'm feeling pretty good. And, uh, but here's the interesting thing. While we were waiting outside, and even while we were in the living room, we never talked business. Never talked business. It wasn't time. We'd have some hors d'oeuvres there, and, and then till the staff would come, Mr. Johnson, it's time to go into the dining room, President's dining room. If you had been in the dining room, you know, there's a, a table. The president would sit here with a telephone. The guest of honor to her left, Melissa, Lucy, and Ian. Steak dinner. It's the LBJ Ranch, right? Three, four course din dinner. Uh, no business. No talking. Uh, that, actually, that second dinner, the grandkids were running around. It was one of the grandkids' birthday parties. And they brought a birthday cake. And I said, Lucy. We shouldn't be here, man. This is your, this is your grandkids. I said, nope. You stay right here, you're going to eat cake. <laughs> oh, okay. I felt bad. You know, but that's who they were. You know, they wanted to include you. They wanted you to be part of those memories. Uh, and especially her. So, eat the cake, and then we go into the, to the living room, and only then, only then, 
do we talk business? And you know the business she wanted to talk about? It was what happens when she passes. I'm like, I don't want to have that conversation. No, I'm, I'm not ready for that. No, she was. And it was fascinating, the conversation. And she said, Dave, we're, I'm talking with Lucy and Linda, and you know we're going to give Lucy and Linda. And, but for the Park Service, here's what I'm thinking. Because when, you, when I'm gone, and when you open the house to the nation, I want people to think, I just left the room, and I'll be right back. That was Lady Bird. Again, I didn't want to have this conversation. But it was one of the most memorable experiences I've ever had with a public figure. It was personal. It, it was meaningful. I mean, she was so sincere that she wanted to do the right things for the right reasons for the benefit of the nation. Well, we finish, we embrace, because I knew that was gonna be the last time I would see her as I'm moving to Washington. And uh, so Melissa and I are driving out the gate and I'll never forget the conversation we had. I said, babe, do you, do you realize what just happened? We just had dinner with Lady Bird Johnson. Two kids from Wharton, Texas. You know, humble beginnings. Look at what we just experienced. And we got a little emotional as we drove back to Ron Rock uh, from there. It was interesting because the next day, I'm in my office in Johnson City. And I believe it was Shirley James, uh, Mrs. Johnson's assistant. Uh, and Shirley said, Dave, where are you? I said, I'm here in my office, Shirley. Where do you need me to be? What, what's up? And a little frantic, you know, it, uh, nature in her voice, I'm thinking, Shirley, is everything okay? No, 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 no. I said, how quickly can you get to the, to the ranch? I said, watch me. What do you need? He said, I need you to go to the house, go right into the kitchen, and as soon as you get there, you call me. Okay. And I'm, I'm thinking, man, what's going on? I go into the kitchen, and on the table in the Texas White House is this picture. Wow. Lady Bird wanted to give it to me as a token of the last time we were going to be together. That was waiting for me on the kitchen of the Texas White House. I'll read the inscription. <laughs> David, with heartfelt appreciation for your dedication and caring stewardship of this place, I love so much. I'll tell you, my friends, that this picture and I brought the Texas White House, her White House Diaries, which is out there, because I want you to see the difference in her penmanship. I've been told that she signed this personally, because by this time with her stroke, they were starting to auto-pen. And I want you to see her penmanship on the White House Diaries that she signed on February 8th, 2001, compared to this. This is priceless for me. In the publication, she said, for David Vela, May your Park Service career bring you all the rich joy my own long acquaintance with the MPS brought to me in years past and still. February 8, 2001. So, we moved to Washington. And I learned more about, you know, I'm still associated with, in fact, Lucy told me the only reason why we're letting you go because we have a park in her name and in my daddy's name. That's the only reason why you're going to Washington. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> I hear you. One day, it was in the summertime, I believe in the summertime, my chief ranger comes to my office around 5 o'clock. He said, Dave, I had this somber look. And I said, Chief, what's the matter? And he said, you had not heard the news? I know. What's going on? He said, man, I'm sorry to tell you today because I know how close you were to her, but we lost Mrs. Johnson. I'm like, okay. I, clearly, we knew it was going to come. Shortly after that, I get a call from our regional communications officer and said, Dave, where are you? I said, I'm here, here in the office. Bill, what do you need? Man, I got ABC News. I got NBC News on the line. You must be the only person in Washington that had the relationship with Lady Bird because they want to interview. 
And I said, you. And I said, when? Right now. Lady Bird Johnson Park. Get there. I did eight interviews at Lady Bird Johnson Park, back to back to back to back. Now, the interesting part of it was Melissa had already flew back to Texas. I was scheduled to go the next day. So um, I'm still processing. And until I get a call on the way to BWI Airport, said, Dave, where are you? I said, I'm on my way. Uh, well, we have a favor. <laughs> Name it. Uh, well, we have a special request that we want you to be with Mrs. Johnson for an hour as she lies in state. You and Melissa. So I'll be there all day. Memorial service at the Presidential Library happens. If you remember, you had these marble stairs right up on top. C-SPAN's rolling live. Secret Service detail is off camera. Melissa and I are at the head of her casket. I'm still processing. I, I, it's, it's not real for me yet. Till this Boy Scout in uniform, little kid, boy, walks up those marble steps. He gets to the top of the steps. He does this. I lost it. My knees were shaking. Melissa was having to hold me up. I mean, it just dawned on me that I had lost her. It was painful, but at the same time, the respect this Boy Scout gave to someone he didn't know was so memorable to me. It'll be something that, um, that I will not soon forget. Um, it's hard to kind of put into words, um, you know, when you read about icons in American history. And you think about what it would be like if you had a chance to get to know them. I got to know her. It's one of the blessings of my life. Um, and this image, this picture, now is placed prominently in, in my office study. And I wrote something so that I wouldn't forget. Um, Today she holds a very prominent place in my home office as a reminder of all that is possible if we work together for a common good and purpose and from time to time enjoying the wildflowers along the way. That's my connection to Lady Bird. Now what do you want to talk about? <laughs> There's much more detail in the book, by the way, so. We have time for questions? Hey, hey. Yes, sir. So in the National Park Service, how do you get moved to different places? Is there a certain time span? Or is it global connection? Or how does it work? It's a very good question. Things are starting to change a little bit because in my day when I started in 1981, you had to move for that promotion. Uh, now, it's possible you could have stayed in one park your entire career. Nothing wrong with that. But for me, you remember that Ranger uh, that had that Winchester rifle and that pistol? I wanted to wear that. I couldn't at San Antonio, but I did at Chief Ranger at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia where Lee surrendered to Grant. I lived in the home of the district clerk. Everything in the house was original, the wooden floors. When Lee surrendered to Grant, the Confederate forces lined up their arms on the Lynchburg-Richmond Road right by my house. The last casualty of the Civil War, a Union officer, Custer, violated the ceasefire. Fired cannons, killed a Union officer in my backyard. Oh, my. oh, it was fascinating. Oh, I could tell you Appomattox Civil War stories. That, um, so I moved to get law enforcement and then went to Philadelphia uh, promotion. Then I had a 10-year absence for the Park Service, where, uh, which was hard, where I worked as a federal agent doing white-collar criminal investigations in the streets of New York City in the 80s. Moved back to Texas, where I worked for the legendary Mickey Leland, who replaced Barbara Jordan of Houston. Uh, I still have Mickey's itinerary. As you remember, Mickey died tragically in a plane crash in Ethiopia. From Ethiopia, he was going to go meet with the Prime Minister in Israel and then meet up with his wife and young son in Disneyland. He never made it. I still have his itinerary. I was his first special assistant 
for Hispanic Affairs. I ran a, a Texas uh, a state law enforcement agency for the Attorney General of Texas. I uh, held local office. Uh, go on now. I then came back to the Park Service in 1988. Superintendent in multiple parks. Um, regional director in Atlanta had 66 parks. All the national parks in the southeastern United States, Puerto Rico and the Caribbean. Uh, three tours in Washington, uh, and then Grand Teton National Park, the very first park that changed my life as the 21st superintendent. 45 years later, the 21st superintendent. Frankly, that was going to be our last assignment. Uh, well, why wouldn't it be? Jackson Hole, Grand Teton? Till Washington called, uh, the Secretary's office, in this case Secretary Ryan Zinke's office, called and said, how quick can you get to Washington? Watch me. <laughs> what do you need? Not knowing why I was being summoned. I'm in a, in, a, in, a, in a private meeting in the secretary's office, very ornate. It's the largest cabinet office in the cabinet, um, by inches, by design, in the Department of the Interior. And he said, Dave, you know why you're here? I said, no, sir. What can I do for you? And the first question that he asked of me was, um, how do we fix the National Park Service? I mean, fix it? Uh, okay. I realized I was being interviewed to be the 19th director of the National Park Service. I was nominated by President Trump as the first Latino in the history of the National Park Service, went through Senate confirmation. Now, you remember what I told you earlier about politics? I pride myself on being able to work all sides of the political aisle, pride myself. I'm one of the few people in that Congress, uh, in the Senate, to get a unanimous vote out of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, unanimous. After the vote was taken, there's one U.S. Senator that always voted against every Trump nominee. Every Trump nominee, no matter who it was. Um, I then got a hold of that Senator, we got to know each other, and I had the Senator's full support. Unfortunately, Hundreds of us got out of committees, and you have to go to the floor of the Senate. And 10, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night, you have the president of the Senate of the majority party, in this case Republican, and a senator. Mr. President, I hereby seek unanimous consent for Raymond David Vela of Texas to be the 19th director of the National Park Service. Without objection, so ordered. Boom. That's it. You're done. That never happened. They ran out of time. Oh, Ran out of time. By this time, I was deputy director of the National Park Service. I was the number two running the agency. When a new Congress comes in, the president has to renominate you. You have to start all over again. But because the Senate flipped, Joe Manchin, Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, was chair. When the Senate flipped, Joe Manchin, who's still there as chair of the Senate Energy and Natural Resource Committee, called me and said, Dave, uh, the president going to renominate you? I said, I have no idea, sir. They said, well, we're not going to have you go through confirmation again. We're going to put you right on the floor. You, you will be confirmed. Many of us, hundreds of us, never got renominated. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing because by secretary order, that's why my title is deputy director exercising the authority of the director. I still sat in the chair for a year and ran the National Park Service. So, so from that first experience in Grand Teton to running the National Park Service, was one of the blessings of my life. It's a long response to your question, but that's the story. Law director, COVID hit. Law director, George Floyd was murdered. I'm dealing with um, riots in the nation's capital. I'm dealing with requests to remove Confederate statues from national parks, which I refuse to do because they tell a story, as painful as it may be. And what a lot of people don't understand, I took hits from media, I took hits from communities of color, and I respect that. But many of those monuments that are on battlefields today were put together by the combatants themselves. After the war, they would have reunions on those very battlefield sites. They were able to reconcile. Why can't the nation? So, they tell stories, as painful as they may be, but they themselves put a lot of those monuments 
on American battlefields run by the National Park Service, they're still there. Okay, so it was a, a series of uh, interesting experiences, but at the end of the day, we decided to, after nearly 40 years, it's time to go back to Texas. And uh, that's why we're with you here tonight. Any other questions? Sir? We live in uh, Bryan College Station. You know, Aggies, you know, it's that, you know, that. Yeah. Plus, our daughter has five kids, and so in College Station. Um, so it's, it's convenient. I, it's close to Houston, I fly a lot. I, uh, you know, the book, uh, we have book events around the country, but also uh, at form of a consulting, heritage consulting company. I just got back from the Middle East not too long ago where we're consulting with world heritage areas, uh, which is quite fascinating. You're looking at history that goes back seven to 10,000 years. It's fascinating. So they're still trying to stay involved a little bit, but it's about grandkids, and uh, it's about just kind of slower pace. Yes, ma'am. Um, the Johnson Ranch yes. is also a working ranch. Yes, it is. So yes, a absolutely. Bit. The president uh, wanted to, to demonstrate the latest technologies and ranching and conservation practices. I, I think he suspected, I mean, look at the hill country today. Look how dramatically, even when I was there, you know, 15 years ago, how it's changed, but he wanted to preserve the ranching history and heritage uh, and to continue to learn from it. That's why it's still a working ranch. And thank goodness that he made that decision because of what, what's surrounding the ranch now. Uh, which, I'm not saying that's a negative thing, but as far as ranching? Winery. Well, yeah, winery. So the ranching heritage of the hill country, it will always be there. That was the president's decision. And a, and, a, and a good one. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. What are some adjectives that you would use to describe Lady Bird? Oh. I know there's a long list. <laughs> you know, for me, humility, a person of faith. Uh, Lady, Lady Bird had the ability, you could be in a room of 500, but when you talked to her, you were the only one that mattered in the room. You know, and Lucy and Linda have that, that, that capability as well, uh, is that personal connection. When, when I was a superintendent at, uh, in Grand Teton, it was the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Wilderness Act, so I called Lucy, I said, Lucy, want to come to Grand Teton? Uh, I want you to help commemorate in Grand Teton National Park the president's legacy, conservation like leg wilderness legacy. So she did. And you know, there are a lot of people from Texas that go to Grand Teton, and we have beautiful pullouts. And I said, come on, let me take you through the park, her and Ian. And we'd, we'd go, and, uh, and I'd be in uniform. And you could see the, the fellow Texans, and they were like, is that Lucy? Yeah. <laughs> and and, and I, in law enforcement, you're trained to, to learn body language. And so I, I said, hey, Lucy, come on. I said, hey, folks. Where are you from? Well, we're from Texas. Oh, really? Hey, well, welcome to Grand Teton National Park. Would you like to meet a fellow Texan? <laughs> They're like, yes. So uh, yeah, she's found hundreds of pictures in, in Grand Teton National Park. Um, but she, oh my gosh, had that, that just humility, that spirituality that was, I mean, intoxicating, that you didn't want to stop. The, the challenge you had was just not occupying all her time with your room of 500 or 50 or 25, because she had that gift. Um, I, uh, it, I can keep going on and on, uh, but she's still, you know, a smile. I mean, still that inspiration uh, for me. What else? Are we running time? How many different places did she live? Did Lady Bird live? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I know that she had a place, and she would come out to the ranch on holidays and on weekends. Uh, but when she had her stroke, it was fewer times. Uh, but I know that she had a place in Austin, and Lucy was con constantly with her too, which was which was a really good thing. She uh, grew up from childhood. You know, that's a really, I know she grew up in East Texas, and the story of this, how she got the name Lady Bird is fascinating, because there are a whole bunch of books that have been written about Lady Bird. I don't know the specifics of that, uh, but uh, 
uh, when you think about, you know, when the, when the president was a member of Congress and he was Senate Majority Leader, you know, and their, their home in Washington, D.C., uh, clear the presidency, and I mean, I would envision... Where, where did she meet him? Uh, who knows that story? Yes, Debbie? UT. UT. See, that's why I didn't want to answer that. She was <laughs> you know, Aggies have a diff, right? Aggies have a little trouble, you know. It's just her first. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Folks, uh, let me again close by just thanking you again for this opportunity. Uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be able to talk about my dear friend. And um, thanks for coming. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Give me the LBJ uh, Ladybird rate. Yeah. <laughs> right, thank you all for coming. Uh, January 20th, we'll hold our second uh, gala. That's a benefit for the, for the museum. So plan to be there. Uh, we hope to have a good, wonderful time. And then uh, we'll have our spring lecture sometime in March. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Hope to see you again.